Hello, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone here and we will start our webinar. So let me um, let me give you a quick uh, intro. So today we have a really uh, special webinar and special guest. Today we have uh, Vlad Podolyaka with us. Uh, he is CEO of Belkins and Folderly. And today we will be talking about ROI. And I think this is like a very interesting topic and this topic concerns a lot of businesses. So let's get started. Um, a quick note, uh, we'll be having um, a Q&A session in the end of the webinar. So please uh, prepare and keep all your questions and you can send them uh, in the chat. I will be moderating the chat, so I'm here. And yes, I will be leaving the stage. Guys, have a great webinar and the microphone is yours. Perfect. Thank you, Julia, for the intro. Uh, Vlad, great to have you here. How are you doing? Pleasure is mine. Uh, happy to be with you, Josh, today. So super excited and happy to share all those insights and metrics and give the like actual insights about how to get the work done with the ROI. Yeah, for sure. Uh, very interesting topic. In case you might be wondering, uh, we're not going to give you a Google definition of what ROI is. We figured most of you have used ChatGPT by now or, you know, Google, obviously. Uh, but first off, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, we're going to give a couple more minutes for the rest of our attendees to join. But in the meantime, wanted to kind of start off with a little bit of an icebreaker. So if you can, just we have a chat box in here on our platform. Uh, go ahead and let us know, you know, where you're from. If you work from a specific company, you can, you know, leave that information as well. But we're really curious to see where y'all are from. So if you're stateside, if you're in EU, if you're in Australia, wherever you are, it's always great to see guests from all around the world. But before we go ahead and get started, wanted to kind of give you guys the 411 on who we are and why we decided to talk about this today. So my name is Josh Pratt and I am the outreach expert here at Belkins. I originally started here as an account manager and really understood that I love doing everything content related. So started kind of working in our marketing team to make videos on our YouTube, which if you haven't checked out, please sure to go and check it out. You can find it by just typing Belkins in YouTube itself. Uh, but then also doing these webinars and having the honor and the pleasure to talk with some very experienced, very good professionals uh, like Vlad himself today. So i um, very excited to be talking with you today, Vlad. Let's, uh, you want to share a couple words about yourself? Yeah, likewise. Thank you, Josh. So as you probably already know, my name is Vlad and I'm founder of Belkins and Paul Julie. So yeah, I'm kind of the guy who always building companies, products, services, and I'm like, a lot of experience and a lot of like did a lot of mistakes and learn from them to on my like own practice and my own experience on all, all this all on all of those kind of things that happened after six years of building those kind of great companies so happy to share it with you and as you probably know Balkans already have like 300 people and it's our sales agency b2b sales agency would mean focus on lead generation appointment setting and a few words about Folgerly. Folgerly is a all-in-one email solution platform to handle your email deliverability so you do like work with this headache and Folgerly will do this by your by your hand yeah so I think, Perfect. yeah, we can start. Okay. So I was just, uh, these past few days, as I was preparing for our webinar, I was looking at just everything on ROI. And it's so funny because like most of you have probably experienced, if you've experienced this, be sure and leave like a, yes, I've experienced this in the chat. But when you talk about something, when you search something, whatever you're doing, if you're looking up something, it seems like somehow social media has a tendency of actually like tracking that and then giving you information in their advertisements and their related searches. That is exactly like what you were just talking about, which is kind of creepy, but honestly, uh, we're all pretty much used to it by now. Um, so while I was looking at ROI and talking about ROI, 
with my friends and colleagues, um, I actually found this Instagram post that I just had to share today. Um, so if you check it out on the screen, uh, best marketing move ever. So Domino's actually decided to invest their own money into filling potholes that the city didn't end up getting to. And if, if you think about it, if you see a pothole and you got the Domino sign on it, you're automatically thinking, well, that's great. I hate the potholes. I love pizza. Who better to support than Domino's for actually putting, you know, these, <laughs> these issues out of our hands. So um, that's a great idea and a great just in general strategy for, for ROI. You know, they invested money into filling potholes, but then definitely saw a return on their investment because everyone's happy that they can drive on, you know, nice, clean, um, repaired roads. So anyways, yeah, enough with the fun meme. Um, awesome. Now I want pizza. Yeah, me too. So, okay. So before we get to our first section, how to accurately measure return on expenditures, Vlad's five crucial metrics, I am going to be throwing a poll up here. So if you look on your screen, there's chat and then there should be a poll section. Um, you should be seeing a poll appearing on your screen right now. So feel free to take part in that poll. We're very interested to hear back from you. But in the meantime, Vlad, I'm interested to hear more on your five metrics. Yeah, so definitely, definitely happy to share. So um, I will start with the like sharing experience, talking with the clients on the sales calls. So um, this is important before jumping on the, on the kind of metrics topic. So when we are doing our sales calls and me personally, I'm always asking our clients in regards to like what they do with their sales and marketing activities, how big is their team, et cetera, et cetera. And by doing this way, I'm like kind of always structuring my sales speech accordingly to answers that they give to me. And one of the questions that I always ask to understand if clients understand what kind of wall email marketing, maybe some part of email marketing, or maybe some part of sales processes that they know about and what they wanted to do with us. And in the part of Belkins, we always bring them value in like getting more and more clients. So my questions is simple. And based on those kind of five metrics, I'm always understand how big is experience of working with sales and marketing on the client side. And, and it gives me an idea how they can benefit working with us. So as this being said, so five metrics, the customer acquisition cost, the first one, uh, it's CAC. So um, it's all about the price that you end up by like closing uh, or scheduling your meetings, closing uh, your deals. And uh, it matter because it depends on what kind of channel are you using in order to get more and more clients, it can be like cold calling, email marketing, advertising, social, word of mouth, etc. But you need to find and always define the most efficient for you. And uh, from our experience, the first the first acquisition channel and with the most like kind of cheapest cost from others, it would be email marketing because like. It's no brainer for you to create an email like address on the G Suite or Microsoft Outlook Exchange, upload your leads, get the email content that will convert, or you can use like ChatGPT or whatever, and start to send your emails in the same right moment and getting answers. So basically, you can try your best of luck to schedule those meetings like right away, basically. And this is why the email marketing, the most cheapest customer acquisition channel and uh, there's like it like the actual number it depends on the a number of the one lead that getting from your acquisition channels it depends on size of the companies of your ideal customer profiles on your value proposition and like multiple criteria like your buyer persona or any other things like i don't know like number of headcount, maybe average number of revenue of the company that, that they have. And you always end up from our experience on the average numbers. And I can range it from like good customer acquisition, like average and bad. And um, again, depending on your average chat or depending on your product or service, it can uh, like fluctuate on different, uh, different sites. 
but good to have when you are lending your clients uh, like starting from 100 300 bucks per uh, deal created before even close so the cost of one like deal created from acquisition channel like health number like around 100 300 dollars average would be 300 500, 600, around 700 tops. And the high acquisition cost, when you pay for one like lead, for one appointment or one conversion to like platform, to trial or to the deal created, thousand plus. So when you have thousand plus, so meaning that you have like higher check, you have working with mid-sized enterprise companies, obviously, and you end up with a higher sales cycle and you need a bunch of those because you probably end up with close one of leads that cost 1000 plus dollars per lead like around six plus months so you will get your like simply by knowing your customer acquisition cost you can say that when i get my roi like uh, taking into effect other metrics and speaking of those metrics customer lifetime value ltv it's more on the retention side so i will circle back like in a moment sales cycle average conversion rate and average sales check so those five metrics is basically three main departments or main functions that you need to pay your attention with so first of all marketing gathering the opportunities gathering the leads gathering the all those appointments next thing sales sales function it depends your uh, like when you close your lead, your sales cycle, and depending again on the size of the chip, the size of the companies that you work with, average conversion rate. So you simply can count like, like from our experience, the average conversion rate from outbound leads at around like seven, ten percent, from inbound 10, 15 percent, and every sales check depending on your value proposition. And so taking the fact that you knowing all of those like five metrics that you know how your marketing delivery and sales works and you will end up like with understanding how it can like get beneficial in terms of like getting ROI upon your investments knowing how much it costs like to generate one opportunity for me how long would be the sales cycle what is my average conversion rate meaning that for instance if I have 10% conversion rate I need like hundreds of opportunities to close 10 clients of those and meaning that uh, I will end up in spending at least like 100,000 like or ten, like 10,000 up to 100,000 on your customer acquisition before you even get the, your ROI so that's the crucial to think about and like circling back on the like like last metric like customer life and value it's more on the delivery and retention side so Imagine when you spend like thousand dollar on like getting your lead, or maybe let's say ten thousand. You close one of this uh, like kind of client. You let's say your average sales like paycheck would be like fifteen twenty grand, and um, and this client will churn the next month or months after that. So basically, you spend ten grand, you close one client, and you like immediately lose this client. So the customer lifetime value. And all of those like alongside metrics was this uh, was a life a, a, a customer life life cycle lifetime value is measures and you always need to work with your clients on the retention side because you need to understand that you pay a lot of like tons of money on your marketing acquisition before even close anything so like this is the main crucial metrics yeah Josh so if uh... Yeah, if you don't mind me interrupting you. So basically, I mean, obviously what we've all kind of heard the ROI statement as um, it's usually what you're spending versus what you're getting, um, if you kind of simplify it that way. But, you know, from what you're saying and from what I agree with you on is the fact that it's not just about getting a new client. It's also about making sure that they're left happy for the longest time possible. Because ultimately, if you get, you know, a client after spending X amount of dollars, and then they leave after a month, your ROI could be negative, correct? I mean, you know, it's definitely, I think that retention is something that we really need to keep on the table here as well. Um, and if you understand for sure that you're spending X amount of dollars to get X amount of clients, but 
maybe 90% of those clients are all leaving, then your ROI might have been positive for a month, but you're still looking at a negative ROI in the long term. So I couldn't agree more with all of your points. I think they're all really straightforward, right? Exactly where they should be. Um, just kind of fun fact for, you know, all of you watching today. Um, so ROI was actually introduced in 1914. Um, and it's actually helped companies and businesses all around the world. Um, and interesting enough that a lot of people don't think of ROI as besides financial. They think of it as more just, you know, I need to make sure that my ROI is um, in my financial expectations and in my budget and whatnot. But ROI can be, you know, applied in other areas as well. So like marketing, employee training programs, um, technology implementations. Overall, it's, you know, what you're getting out of what you're spending and then how long that's actually lasting with you. So um, I know that you and I, when we talked before hopping on our webinar today, basically you you kind of uh, summarized it in a, in a very simple, straightforward way that I think a lot of people, you know, should definitely hear. And that is just spend less than you get in return. You know, you don't want to spend a ton of money and then not get any kind of return on that investment that then just puts you below what you're expecting in, in the long run. So uh, great information, great points. I, I couldn't agree with you anymore. Yeah, 100%. And also you need to take in the fact that the, the thing that Josh said, so you can like really end up with that you have a lot of clients, but you have a negative ROI. So meaning that you are going to like cash minus on your revenue. So, uh, uh, meaning that you get like delivering the actual performance, not meaning that you are getting the ROI from all those campaigns. So that's the crucial thing to remember. And yeah, yeah, for sure. And something that's also kind of overlooked, I feel, um, is the fact that ROI is not a static number. It's a dynamic number. Um, you know, it's, it's, it requires constant monitoring because things change, you know, processes change, prices change, as we've all been seeing here with the, um, economic, economic instability, prices are just kind of going up. Um, I even saw a video not long ago about what you could buy in 2010 at, with 50 bucks at Walmart and then what you can buy now. And it's just like mind blowing. It's like, everything is going up. Prices are going up. Salaries are hopefully kind of keeping their way up as well, but it's still, you know, everything's tied so close into each other that you need to just constantly monitor, not like once a year, not like once a month. Vlad, what would you say? How, how often should you be focusing on tracking your ROI? Once a day, once a week, what are your thoughts? So it depends on your like function, but as a chief executive officer, I can say that like, for some period of time, I'm like kind of check this, but on a daily basis, like I'm always like woke up and get my phone and seeing that what kind of metrics we have, like what kind of clients and always like pay attention to all those financial P and L's and, and you will have like just better understanding how, how are you going? And uh, if there is like crisis out there, like kind of downturn, so you need hundred percent pay attention to your ROI because uh, you don't want to be out of the business because of like those kind of simple mistakes. So there you have it, folks. If you don't know what it's like to be a CEO, uh, Vlad just said, first thing you do when you wake up, check your phone, see how everything's going. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's one of the shortest versions of what it means to be a CEO. I'm sure that there's a lot more that we just don't have time to get to today. But some interesting ROI stats. Um, regarding different channels. So direct marketing association reports that email marketing has an average ROI of 3,800%. So for every dollar spent, business is gonna expect an average return of 38. So uh, you'd mentioned this earlier that, you know, email marketing is one of the cheapest options, if not the cheapest option. Uh, fun fact for you all, if you didn't know, it's actually still to this day, the most effective marketing channel. So if you're not doing any kind of outreach, I would recommend highly investing in, you know, learning how to do that effectively or using a company like Belkins, for example, that can just run that all for you. Um, it's very, a lot more detailed than what you would expect. I mean, remembering when I worked in sales, it was kind of just like, here's a lead list, just spam everybody and write everybody and call everybody. And then we're all kind of scratching our heads. Why are people not responding and whatnot? And half of the people weren't actually getting the emails because we didn't have any kind of deliverability check, which Foldly can offer, for example. But um, in general, you know, we actually, like I mentioned in the beginning, we have a YouTube channel. We have tons of videos on different topics, you know, whether it's 
how do you write correct templates, review of templates? How do you check your mailbox for spam issues? How do you get out of the spam issues that you see on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? Tons of other videos that are related to outreach, sales, marketing. If you haven't checked it out, be sure and check it out because, um, you know, hopefully what you find and what you see will really help you because if you don't have the option of working with some some company like ours, for example, um, we want to want to equip you with the most effective tools and the most effective strategies that you can possibly get. So anyways, moving on. So 1.7 trillion by 2023, according to a report by Forrester, mobile influence sales represent a substantial opportunity for business to leverage mobile marketing channels. Um, I think it's safe to say that by now, everybody's got one of these. As much as you don't like sitting on a phone, it's just kind of the new thing. And it's it's one of those trends that's not going away anytime soon. Before long, we might even have chips in our heads that are just like to get everything done quicker because we don't have the time to write and respond to everything. Uh, especially if you're like Vlad, you're a CEO. He said he had like eight calls today before our webinar. So um, busy, busy, busy. Mobile is definitely something that we're seeing a huge just increase on everybody's actually opening their emails in mobile now you know everyone's wanting to close deals on mobile they don't want to actually have to access their computer um you know three times more leads though so vlad what do you think you know marketing institute states that companies that invest in content marketing have an average conversion rate of six percent which is higher than those who don't prioritize content creation so that's you as a ceo yeah, yeah. What do you have time to watch content? What do you yeah, think of so this? So, as a CEO and founder, I have no time to watch anything. But I'm strongly suggest to have like those kind of snapshots on what kind of going on the like on the market or where was your niche industry. I strongly suggest to like subscribe to some folks like Morning Brew or Belkins, obviously, and maybe uh, the hustle from HubSpot also beneficial in terms of like, getting the great insight on the sales and marketing news but again yeah so i'm totally agree that that uh, if company is starting to spend on content generation and starting to like fuel their inbound machine and starting to get the inbound leads that's the great 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 like mechanism in order to decrease your customer acquisition cost and have more and more leads so um when we started Balkans, we started with album marketing. So we draw, drive first clients with those email marketing practices that I that I just shared with you, like having just leads templates on your by like written by your hand, uh, like simply the mailbox under the G Suite, sending like hundreds, thousands of those emails, getting the conversion rate like ten percent from thousands of emails and answers, and working with those answers um and then then we like starting to convert them but it seems is if there's like we're speaking about the outbound and the, those things kind of cold and they don't want to get your emails don't want to get them to jump on the call with you and you're starting to be like pain in yes to talk with them and uh, you just need to understand that outbound is the good to drive first clients or maybe sustain your pipeline for a while but when you're alongside, especially when you like drive first clients and starting to reinvest those money, I'm strongly suggest to reinvest those money to the content marketing and starting to work on your blog, maybe some materials, webinars, podcasts, maybe start to invest more in some like additional like newsletter, nurturing. And uh, as a result, like of constant working with the co like content on your on your website, with your leads, with your subscribers, you will starting to generate new opportunities. Meanwhile, outbound like generating like mm -hmm. some some same amount of like leads for you for your sales team or maybe for your own. But yeah, you need to take in fact that when you are starting to reinvest money and the content strategy, if you are doing this right, and by mean right, by, by by saying right, I mean doing this constantly on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a yearly basis you will end up that you have your organic traffic, organic leads, your uh, like your potential clients, like say napping for your like, product, service, whatever. And meaning that you do not need to send any emails, drive some uh, like advertising, on, to, to, like call, call them because they like having time to buy and go with you. So you will decrease your customer acquisition cost, I guess, twice or thrice if you will like have your e inbound 
machine working for you. But like 100%, you will increase your leads even more than tries. I think something also that's important to notice is, you know, a lot of what we've actually read in, you know, average stats have shown over the years that a lot of people, in fact, on average, it takes about like seven to 11 points, you know, touch points to actually get an answer, whether that be a yes, I'm interested in hopping in a meeting or after the call, actually having a yes, I'm going to move forward or not. Um, it's, it's those touch points that also play a huge part, which kind of ties into our fourth point, which is 75% reported positive ROI um, because their social media efforts have increased their exposure. Um, if you think about it, so um, let's take maybe say seven touch points, right? That means any way that you're reaching out to your prospect, your lead. So if you're saying, I'm gonna send seven emails to this person, the person's probably going to get annoyed because you're writing way too many emails. If you do emails and then calls, person might get annoyed that you're calling them because it seems like on average, more, more people don't like getting a phone call because they just don't like getting that ringtone going in the middle of their workday. Um, LinkedIn has been effective and it's, it's definitely growing as of late, but those kind of slight touches that make an impact that help you to defend your case, whether that be social proof testimonials or case studies, um, it's what it's everything that you put in your content. So imagine you reach out to somebody first by email, then you write them a message on LinkedIn and then they randomly see one of your posts because they are in your connections or they are following your page or however they get it. They're seeing another touch point from you that's directed towards them and everyone else in, in society. But in a sense of instead of me annoying you and pushing you and pushing you and pushing you, it's just this is an informa informative post about A, B and C. And it's another touch point that also works as well. So and if you think about it that way, instead of just writing seven emails, it's three emails, two posts and one LinkedIn message. And that really does help. So digital content and any kind of content, whether it be videos, webinars, podcasts, any kind of you know blog articles, th there's definitely a lot more power in those than people think, because I think I'm just gonna post this and I'm gonna hope for the best. But it's those, very often, it's those posts that we make that nobody ever does anything about, but then after a couple months of constantly hearing about us, then they reach out to us, they're not gonna say, I reached out to you because of this post. They're going to reach out and say, I reached out to you because I've been seeing constantly these, these good posts. And so that's something that very often in sales, you'll also see that, you know, a lot of people will say, um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in working with you because of A, B, and C. And they're like, okay, perfect. Yeah. How did you hear about us? I don't remember. I saw a post that I really liked that it kind of fit my pain points. And it's, it's those kind of silent, but in a way deadly, not deadly, but silent, but effective you know, strategies that work, that really do work, that comes off in a, in a sense of, instead of spamming you, I'm actually gonna uplift you and give you more information and share more insights on why this works, why you should be a part of it and why you should jump on the bandwagon. So anyways, uh, don't want us to take too much time on this slide, let's go ahead and move forward. So what is a good sales ROI? Um, I would say anything positive. <laughs> Vlad, what would you say? Yeah, I totally agree. Anything positive because you can like always reinvest and get more and more and more and this about the scalability. It's a hundred percent. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and throw up another poll. If you can go ahead and leave your thoughts and your answers. Um, how important is the concept of ROI in your decision-making process? So if you haven't really dive in, in, if you haven't really dived into what ROI is and how effective it can be, um, I think that both Vlad and I would agree that it is very important that you constantly check this because overall, you know, it's good to know what you're spending and what you're getting in return, but there's so much more of a science behind it of also understanding, okay, if I have an ROI that's positive, that's great, but how can I make that positive ROI X times better? To the point where you're satisfied, obviously you're not going, you're not, you know, you're not going bankrupt. You're not losing money, but why sit in, in that position? Why not try and increase? Why not try and be better? So which channels have a positive ROI, which channels have a 0% uh, ROI? What do I need to change? How do I need to change it? What can I implement that would actually give me physical results that I'm actually growing and that our channel is doing better or our company is doing better and that our offering is doing better than it was three months ago or a year ago. Um, so six factors that have the greatest impact on sales ROI, marketing strategy and effectiveness. 
Uh, and then also kind of tied in sales team performance and efficiency. We just talked about this on our last webinar with Brian from Balkans as well, um, our VP of sales. And if you haven't heard this term, smarketing, I recommend thinking about it. It's sales, marketing, smarketing. Make the two aligned. You know, it's so important that both your marketing strategy and your marketing effectiveness ties in strongly with your sales team performance and their efficiency because in one way or another they are going to be working together some way and if they're not aligned and if they're not working together as a team it can get to the point where there's so much chaos there's so much you know honestly just craziness going on because marketing is doing their thing sales doing their thing and then when one thing goes bad both teams are left with these questions and they're like what's going on with your division what's going on with your division Instead, if you have them very aligned, you can work together to understand what's not working. You can work together to understand how we can improve, but also you can celebrate the successes together, which everyone wants to celebrate successes together. Um, next point, product or service differentiation and quality. Vlad, what would you say on that? You know, so this definitely does impact and how would you say? Yeah, and talking about like differentiation quality. So it's more about value proposition side and, we always like having our company, we have our like service offering, product offering, and uh, it really depends how you are getting care right because it's bounded to marketing strategy again, because you always need to understand what is your like target audience, for instance, what is your differentiation, like, like comparing you to the competitors and uh, what is the quality that you're drawing on the delivery side and again speaking that all those things like heavily bounded you cannot just rely on the ROI like hitting for 10,000 on advertising hitting 10,000 on like, email marketing and get the ROI from it because it's like maybe 10 years ago it war it will work but now it's like uh, the omnichannel is the smart word that uh, like bounty gold is approaches with social media, multiple touches with emails, calls, advertising, etc. So the service and product differentiation is really matters because you have this red ocean out there where a lot of competitors, a lot of like people doing the same or maybe close to, to you and 100% uh, that someone already building something that you probably like thinking of or maybe alongside with you, maybe somewhere in Asia, maybe somewhere in Latam, or maybe in other like regions. So taking the fact that there is a lot of local markets, there is a lot of competition. And maybe if you are like targeting world worldwide, you like will fail. But if you will target, especially like US, special like states, maybe some industries and differentiate your product and service for them, you will be more successful than you will like spray and spray like doing this kind of uh, worldwide and like quality so quality always is the key like when you have quality services quality product people will start to talk about your product and you will unlock this more word word of mouth acquisition channel which is like 100 percent cheap it's all on your reputation build the trust with uh, your fault with your clients and the quality that you need to take care of like 100 percent on each and every stage no matter what you're building product or service so it's kind of 100 percent matters and so if if you were to summarize it sorry to interrupt you it'd be it, like awareness right so awareness of understanding what your quality comp how your quality compares to other competitors that are offering somewhat similar but then also you know the differentiation you know just understanding the whole general sense of what is available to the general public how do i stand out how do in a sense point three and four so product or service and for differentiation and quality also with pricing strategy and competitive positioning you know you understand how you compare you understand what other options are on the table for all of the potential vendors um, or new collaborations but you have a general sense of how to stand out. Would, would you say that's true? Yeah, but uh, to give our audience, uh, to our listeners today, their like practical advice. So I would strongly suggest not to focus on like uh, having like bullet points. So one, two, three, four, five, in terms of like how I'm different, but uh, focus on actual value that your clients getting from you. Like if you're in, you know, like a fintech service, you probably save some money on like personal corporate spend. And you can talk 
numbers and always talk numbers because uh, people that like wanted to work with you, like maybe your potential clients, future clients, they always evaluate you from the same standpoint that we're kind of talking right now. What kind of ROI that I will get from this tool or why do I need to spend 500, like 10 bucks, 500, 1000 or 10,000 bucks for some particular solution or service if the, if I don't understand how I get like benefits from or what, what in, like in terms of ROI, if I'm especially working with businesses like in B2B, everyone always count minus. So basically when you are saying that your tool yeah. like costs 1000 or your service costs like five, like the five grand. So basically you need to understand that people expecting to get like twice tries from it, like as no brainer. So if you are, if they willing to spend with you, they wanted to get, wanted to get like a ride from it. And I'm like, I have great experience in my life when we work with some kind of companies that I work uh, from, work with, um, we were like SaaS product in news and media analytics and our target audience were media holdings like Washington Post, uh, New York Times, BBC and others. And we like heavy selling those kind of analytics solution. And you would say, why they need this if there is like Google Analytics and all the, all those other tools. And yeah, this is the main concern from them. So why the news and media companies need to like pay five grand or 10 grand or whatever, like some there for some solution, which is just analyze numbers when taking the fact that news and media companies struggles to getting monetize their content because everything's free over the internet. And uh, back then it was like a great solution to build the paywall. Like uh, you have like one box per article rather than spend some solutions in terms of like analytics. But yeah, you got my point in terms of what they get from you as really matters before like any differentiation. Because if you will uh, say that you will uh, beneficial, like working with me, you will get like 10 grand. It's kind of easy sell, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And I think it definitely ties in with points five and six. It's the same thing. It's like, if your clients are happy, most of the chance, I mean, honestly, most of the times your clients are gonna be happy when they understand that you're on top of things, whether that be understanding what's going on in the world right now, whether that's understanding what the trends are. So if first per se, a client came to us and said, I need an appointment service, uh, appointment setting service. I need this amount of appointments every month. And I want my out, outreach channels to be up to date, meaning I need to know what's being most utilized, what's being most effective. They're going to feel confident and their retention is going to be great when they understand that you're on top. You're not just like, oh, I think, you know, email marketing should work for us. I don't know, but you know, it's it's definitely all, I mean, all six of these factors really do tie in together in, in a sense, but I don't really have the time to, to kind of talk about all of them. We don't really have the time. We don't want everyone to be bored, but um, it, it's definitely the fact that, you know, all the demands, all the trends, customer relationships, they need to be nurtured in such a way that everyone feels that everyone's on the same page and we're all moving forward and we understand what's really happening right now and how to be the most effective. And that really does, that confidence really does help with our ROI as well, because if we don't feel that the potential people that are working for us understand what they're doing, it kind of creates a sense of, you know, I'm a little bit worried. I, I'm not really positive that this is a good option. And that in the sense is the very first step to a decline, uh, a negative ROI or, you know, a churn or whatnot. So yeah, uh, we're gonna have to keep moving forward because I don't want to cut off our question and answer time at the end. So how to calculate your sales budget, no matter your industry size. Uh, these are very important. So evaluate historical data, set realistic sales goals, consider market factors, allocate resources and monitor and adjust. Um, I think all of these tie together very, you know, very effectively. And um, you can see there's, you know, a little more information under each one. But, you know, if you're not evaluating history, if you're not studying history, you're not going to learn from past mistakes, past successes. If you're not setting realistic goals, you're constantly going to be looking at a negative ROI or a negative impact because you're not reaching what you're actually able or capable of reaching. Um, market factors also plays a huge part. If you're not understanding what the market is offering or what the market is um, being impacted by right now, 
you're not understanding how to be the most effective. You know, the resources is obviously something that everyone understands we need to have. And then monitor, monitor and adjust. I think that's probably the word that I've said the most after working with Balkans this long is flexibility, being flexible, monitoring everything, understanding everything, analyzing everything, understanding each moving part, what needs to be fixed, what doesn't need to be fixed, what's bringing me positive results, what's bringing me negative results. Um, so moving on, before allocating budget, ask yourself the next question. How big is a campaign budget? Which sales channel should I prioritize? How will success be measured? What are the expected returns on investment for each sales activity? What is the time frame for results and what risks, what are the risks in delivering? So what would you say if there's any questions that we maybe missed here, what would you say, Vlad? Yeah. So speaking of allocation of budget, so that's the good point that uh, to calculate your ROI and sales budget and marketing budget is the most important thing that you have your resources. So. As you were like, let's say you're starting a company as a founder and you, your only resource, like you're your salesperson, you're your marketing guy, and you're going to the, all those meetings. And for the fact that you can like understand that there is actually no budget and uh, you will get 100% right because you are spending your time. But when your company is growing, you have your sales execs, you have like, you will have an ability to delegate your like, like like sales goals or maybe marketing activities to get like more scalability on some sort of like sales activities to get more and more traction. So you're starting to reinvest and you will see that you, when you were like one million company, you get like a lot of ROI, a lot of money left, but when you have starting to like having to have people and it's starting to be your like budget. So your sales team, your budget, sales budget, your marketing, your, uh, uh, your marketing budget, and all those people uh, generating the opportunities for you. So let's say you grow to 50, 100 people in your headcount. So you have sustainable marketing department, you have sustainable sales department. And now you know that you, let's say you're spending 20 grand on marketing, 10 grand on sales, and uh, like taking the fact that your customer acquisition cost would be already 40 grand so uh, 30 grand and it's only because you have like sales and marketing people that's related to this particular metric so budget is crucial and you need to pay attention what kind of team not just like like there is like uh, always misunderstanding that my sales or my marketing budget is the like 100 grand that uh, i have for advertising but it's not because there is a people behind and people do their work in order to make those kind of money end up as a clients. So it's not like just my budget as like from money perspective, but from people as well. So uh, like from my experience, a lot of like companies out there keeps forgetting that their actual budget is the people plus tools that you're using plus actual money spent on the each and every acquisition channel so you can end up with 10 grand for one client and you just will discover that you are negative on the ROI and you will like wonder what i need to do and you're starting to see that you need to cut off some things but before, like in order to not end up with cut offing layoffing people cut offing uh, tools you need to justify the actual sales and marketing budget from the headcount and those people that work uh, within your company or maybe you as a seller, uh, sales representative you need to understand that you need to drive clients you need to drive those leads to fulfill the pipelines to get the ROI from the campaign otherwise it doesn't make any sense for a company to like sustain those sales and marketing departments because they didn't drive results and results can be different as i just like told, uh, talk about like Depending on like customer acquisition channel, like email, uh, advertising, there's a variety of things that you can do. So those six questions are crucial, but always ask yourself about those kind of first uh, five measures that I shared with you. You definitely need to know them before moving forward. So it will be uh, like 100% easier. Yeah. And I mean, in general, it's uh, like you mentioned earlier, it's a numbers game. You know, if you're trying to get a new client, numbers work. It's also important internally. If you don't know your numbers, if you're not studying your numbers, your impact is 
a percentage of what it could be potentially. So we have a bonus for you. Uh, we have a QR code on the screen. If you have a phone nearby, just go ahead and scan the QR code and uh, Vlad, you have a better knowledge yeah. of what this is exactly and how to use it. But this is something that you guys should definitely check out. If you do have a phone, please check it yeah, out. Yeah, so we're our actual, in Balkans, we're actually fans of giving uh, like exact value, not just giving you the general terms of the ROI, but the particular like practical cases, let's say, how to implement it and how to utilize it. So uh, Michael in the chat also asked how to measure those on a daily basis. So this is the one of the reasons that I came up with uh, some sort of simple ROI calculator template, which is give you an idea how how I'm getting the ROI, what kind of cost of the leads that I'm getting. And uh, you will see that from this kind of simple metrics and formulas, how like successful am I? If you never did this, it would be really beneficial because it's really like uh, those formulas are there. There is some particular like cases there, like two or three kind of option scenarios to getting your ROI done. So uh, use it and to see that you like positive or negative on your ROI. So pay attention to numbers. And yeah, and by the way, if any of you ever have any questions about ROI or if there's maybe things that we don't talk about today, or maybe there's something that you kind of comes to your mind after we're done with our webinar today, by all means, reach out to us. We're always happy to, to meet with you and talk with you about ROI, about sales, about marketing, about appointment setting, whatever it might be. Um, but so how to boost your ROI by 25%. Um, since we're running low on time, I'm not going to go into the specific, you know, summaries of every single thing, but I think you've got them on the screen. This will be accessible later on YouTube as well. So optimize your email marketing. Account-based marketing should be used. Uh, use LinkedIn. And invest in content marketing, improve sales funnel efficiency, and then retargeting campaigns. Uh, a couple other things that we didn't include today that just kind of come to uh, my mind is investing in your analytics. And we talked about this a little bit already, but you know, there's a lot that you can learn from your analytics, anything that you study, everything that you evaluate. There's a lot of things, a lot of patterns that you can learn that will really help you to understand how to be effective and how to increase your ROI. Because once again, as we mentioned in the beginning, ROI isn't just about finance, it's about your efficiency. It's about understanding what you're getting from what you're investing in. Um, you know, Reducing overhead costs is also another thing that you can help to um, get a better ROI. And then reevaluating your, re your expectations. So understanding that really your expectations aren't something that's like way too far away from what you can actually touch, what you can actually feel, what you can actually accomplish. If you're setting goals, once again, we mentioned this earlier, if you're setting goals that you can't reach, you're constantly demotivating yourself. You're constantly making yourself feel like I'm just a failure. I'm a failure. It's better to set a goal that you can reach, but you understand you're going to have to work really hard to get there. But once you do get there, you understand, okay, I'm moving forward. I'm understanding how to do this better. I'm understanding how to get my ROI better and and, and so on. So um, we're going to go ahead and hop over to our Q&A session here in the next 20 seconds. But if you didn't know much about Belkins and you're, you're randomly here sitting thinking, who is Belkins? I don't know a thing about you. Uh, we wanted to include some information about us. So we have been active since 2017. Uh, we've worked with more than 50 different industries worldwide. Uh, we've had more than 1,000 clients that are satisfied. We sp scheduled over 200,000 appointments, which that's awesome. Um, I'm always happy to be able to read that number because that is not something that you achieve overnight. Um, ROI achieved is 10 to 1 and then 4 million leads generated. So um, once again, if you want to start closing more deals with your ROI focused lead acquisition, scan the QR code and we'll help you and we'll get you all set up and we will um, definitely deliver. So Q and A, once again, we wanted to have some time to just answer any questions you might have. Um, I know that I've, I've heard a lot of really, really helpful and insights from you, Vlad. So once again, thank you so much for being here. Um, but then yes, let's go ahead and spend the next five minutes just, uh, answering any questions that you have. So if you're here, just go ahead and leave your questions in the chat and we will try and answer all of them. Um, yeah, but any, anything else to kind of finish off from your side, Vlad, what would you, if, if we had to, I guess, summarize this so that everyone's left with something that's rememberable, what would you say? Yeah. So, uh, this is the numbers game and, um, 
you always need to know the right numbers before taking in fact any decision so that can be difficult to understand what kind of like smart words we're using today but yeah that's kind of simple when it takes to your company data when you talk with your people with your departments so you basically end up with that it's not that hard it's hard to decrease it or increase it decrease it the customer acquisition uh, cost or uh, increase like uh, ROI that you are getting so that's the always numbers games and you always need to understand that everything should be like crunchable like you always need to crunch your numbers and uh, you will get insights from it even though if you're like small company you always have those numbers uh, yeah so that's the close work with the numbers maybe not on a daily basis uh, maybe not with like super uh, uh, chief financial officer but with your efforts with like simple tools out there with like calculators with uh, chat gpt also the good thing that can help you was uh, let's say you will ask them as your personal sales expert like how to calculate ROI, and you will end up with a formula so it's easy easy to nowadays to get the right numbers to get all those methodology and best practices perfect thank you so our first question anastasia um actually sorry ed can the google sheet be downloaded Vlad, can that sheet be downloaded? Sure, sure. Also, I think Julia will send it with the follow-up after the webinar. So we'll include the, the presentation itself and the entire spreadsheet. So you can either copy your copy this spreadsheet from the link that Josh uh, showed you with the QR code, or you can like wait for the uh, for the follow-up email and download it from there. Okay. Uh, next question from Anastasia is 10% ROI possible. Um, I definitely think that's possible. Yeah, what about you? Yeah, I guess that's a easy question. So it's uh, harder to get twice on the return. Um, but 10%, it's really, really maybe good metrics and easily achievable. But again, taking the fact that there is value proposition and all those things, if you are working with uh clients that you close for one mil and ever check and you trying to close them for 12 months 10 percent is kind of good but but you will end up with a rough road before the given that yeah i would also say that you know obviously in realistic terms um try and set like we mentioned multiple times try and set a percentage of ROI that you know for a fact is possible, that's going to really force you to, to work just super hard to actually achieve that. Because if you're setting your goals that are just way too simple, um, say like, you know, 0.1% ROI, that's, that's achievable. That's not, you're not going to have to do a ton to get that. Um, depending upon what your industry is, depending upon what your offering is, you know, it could be more difficult, but if you're setting too easy goals, you're not going to grow as fast. And that's one thing that we really do believe in here at Belkins is, you know, nonstop growth. We want to keep growing. That's why we set goals for our teams and for our whole company that pushes our limits, pushes us to innovate and learn new things. Um, so Beery with the next question, would you recommend account fully on chat GPT for outreach messages creation? No. Um, for me personally, I would say no. Um, why? A number of reasons. Uh, one, your chat GPT is not going to know the pain points of the specific titles that you're trying to reach out to. You can try and do as much evaluation as possible, but what we've learned, well, I've learned from personal experience is that as much as you try and use chat GPT, just very basically, if you don't know how to correctly answer or co correctly request specific information from chat GPT, it's going to give you answers. Yes. It's going to give you templates. Yes. But it's not going to give you as in depth or very accurate or very just precise email templates or any kind of content that you could write as a human being, knowing your industry, your company size, your target group, your job titles. Um, so I would say that use chat GPT if you can, and if you want to, but make sure that you're implementing any kind of specific important information. So if you're reading, if you're reaching out to somebody in marketing, say, um, I'm re I need an email template for this company, this type of company, this industry 
for these titles, the pain points that I know from personal experience are A, B, and C, include them somehow into my templates so that they can tell that I understand what they're really dealing with that's causing them bottlenecks or setbacks. Um, so I wouldn't rely on it without any kind of very precise or, precise or specific kind of uh, actions that you're requesting from it, but it is a very good assistant. I will, I will put it at that. I also would love to add here that uh, the AI, like AI prompting on the back, there's the good skill. And uh, as being said, that Josh said that uh, the simple request, like write me an email, it's good enough to understand the like email structure at least. But in order to get like actual conversions and to get your email work, if you wanted to use ChatGPT or any other um, language out there, so you basically need to be more advanced with your AI prompting because this, it is all about the data and uh, write request, not just like write me a thumbsing, but act as an email expert working within my company, knowing this fact, this fact, this fact, this fact, and also analyze my website, analyze my few of my clients, and you will spend like at least 40, 50 minutes in order to start like educate your GPT thread uh, before actual good template will came up. So this is the 100% uh, true that you need to be more advanced with AI prompting uh, in order to get the actual results from those. Uh, and then Shabin asks, what is the best medium for outreach in mails, email, or call, cold calls? Um, email marketing is still the best and most effective uh, marketing method, marketing platform. Um, I know that in mails and cold calls are still used to this day. They are effective as well, but there's a very specific strategy behind how to do that. I mean, just the same with email marketing, but it's a little simpler, I feel, with cold call or with uh, email marketing as it would be opposed to like cold calls. Um, and then you also said, what is the ideal response rate for email and in mails? And what would you suggest hyper personalized messages or generic messages to the message to the masses um i would say that as much personalization as you can include you're going to have better chances of getting responses obviously if you're reaching out to everyone um it's going to be hard to personalize in a way that everyone feels very special and they understand that you know what they're talking about but if you're reaching say company sized from five employees all the way up to ten thousand employees reaching out to marketers you can try and generalize in a sense that you're still focusing on something that a marketer would feel or understand or say, oh my gosh, that's so about me, but you're still not gonna be able to get that level of personalization. So sometimes trying too hard to personalize when sending out emails to everybody is gonna be hard. Um, there are a few tactics that you can use. One would be kind of trying to send an email that's a little bit shorter, a little bit more to the point, um, not one of those baity kind of like, you get a $200 jersey if you open this email. You know, don't bait, don't bait people. That doesn't work as effectively as something that really does show this is what we're offering. This is who we've helped. This is how we can help you. Um, can we meet tomorrow or, you know, not leaving them with a bunch of questions. Um, and then an ideal response rate. I don't know, Vlad, would you say there's a specific ideal response rate for email in mails? So it's, it's always like ideal and uh, there's no ideal, but the good, uh, the good response rate, I guess. 100%. Yeah. But yeah, 10, 15% good to like more than 20% your God. So <laughs> speaking of those numbers. Yeah. Yeah. If you're getting 20%, uh, find me on LinkedIn and, and message me what you're using because that's, that's great. 20% is definitely good. Um, all right. We've got about like another minute. If any of this, if any of you have any more questions, um, we are happy to answer, but yeah. Yeah. Also one thing to like finalize about the personalization. I know the case about American Marketing Association, when they like end up with 100,000 subscribers base was hyper personalization. So what they do? So basically they utilize data and the power of machine learning to get to each and every of their subscriber. So attention, 100,000 people, custom email templates for each of them, custom subject lines, custom body, and to those kind of hundred, thousands of emails were unique in a way because they working with the data that they have about those kind of people, what they read about their blog, how they attend the webinars, etc., etc. So basically the data that they gather from their platform and they pull over this kind of huge database and uh, make this hyper personalization and they end up with 
50% or 40% replay rate or so. So that's crazy. That is crazy. And I, I mean, I, th I think very tied like closely to what you just mentioned. Um, if you want to do highly personalized uh, mass emailing, um, I'll give you three words that will blow your mind. And if you don't know about these, reach out to us. We'll tell you more. We'll talk about how to set it up. Um, we'll show you firsthand if you start working with us because that's what we do often. Uh, it's called vario uh, It's called value proposition variables. Very simple, very effective. Instead of sending the same messaging to everybody in every industry and in every title, you're sending a specific industry title or company size a different value proposition. But that's all the time we have for today. So be sure and come back to our next webinars. Um, if you haven't checked out our YouTube, be sure and check it out. Once again, we have tons of videos on how to be more effective in sales marketing. Uh, keep up to date with the trends. We just released our most recent trends blog. So if you haven't seen that yet, um, go ahead and go over there and check it out. And overall, thank you all so much for taking the time to be with us today. I hope you are leaving here with new insights that you didn't know before. Vlad, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you are very, very busy. I appreciate giving us an hour of your time to really just dive in and thank talk you, about this very delicate topic. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, all of you guys have a good rest of your week, and we will see you all in the next webinar. Yeah. Have a great one, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for listening.